Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 404 and 405. Admiral Kirazu's fierce assault, the Straw Hats face certain death, and Eliminated Friends, the final day of the Straw Hat crew. In these episodes, we have got a bunch of disappearances, losses, and a truly devastated Luffy that was, like, really hard to watch. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. And I'm Shane. Hey, everybody. Shane, a.k.a. Kratos, is here with me today for a wannabe. And I have to begin with the obligatory question. Why this episode for a wannabe? Sure. Um, so this is probably my favorite arc of the whole series up to this point. And it's just it's one of those things where it's like, I didn't have that much reading experience when I like got to this part um, of the story, but it was just like, I'd never had a series or anything do exactly what this did. Mm -hmm, It's kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, break both my heart and my expectations for the story in such a dramatic way that, that Mm -hmm. is just like literally anything can happen now. And, uh, and so it's just, it's just such a like, you know, and then also, you know, the, the story has, has always been like political, but like this kind of, you know, this, this arc with the whole like slave trade thing and the celestial dragon there that it really, it really amps up the, the political commentary on certain things, which I always love Definitely. digging into. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just like my favorite arc. And this is, this was a great, you know, it's, it's an emotional moment. This, this mm-hmm. last episode, mm-hmm. you know, leading into the, you know, what's going to happen next. And so, yeah, it's just a great moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I, of course, want to talk about like the end, but can we like, how, how do you about, want to proceed? Sure. So, you know, obviously it is not the case that everybody is now dead and the straw hats are gone and you know the next uh 600 episodes are going to be about you know some some other characters and you know but but it's more like you know what do you first what do you think the possibilities are of, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of what happened to them or you know anything along those lines yeah, so I I said something when we saw Perona get disappeared, mm-hmm. as I'm going to call it. I and he asks the same question like if you could go on vacation anywhere, where would you pick? Mm-hmm. She names a very like specific castle, dope ass situation. Yeah. And then he disappears her, but then we don't see like what happened there. She's just gone as Nami says it. I never saw her again, which uh, sounds pretty dramatic and is true. Yeah. I want to believe that he sends them to their preferred vacation destination. How would that work? I have no fucking clue. No idea. Like, I would normally make a guess about how it's like a mental trip, but they're clearly physically gone. Right. And how can he do that? Like, right. does he send them to an actual place? Does he make them a little, a little bubble where they right. can just be like in their ideal circumstances for a temporary time, like a solitary confinement, but like ideal? Yeah. Does he, because here, like, he asks that question from Zoro, mm-hmm. but he doesn't ask it from anybody else. And I don't think Zoro answers him. I'm right, pretty right. sure he that Zoro is just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? He just gives him a look and is like, shit, uh, this is the real one. 
And I don't know if he needs a reply to like choose where to send them. If he doesn't get a reply, does he tend to send everybody to the wrong place? Like if I'm operating under this assumption, um, there keeps being the references to the bubbles. And I can't tell if that's like a purposeful because they're put into bubbles, like a very literal sort of nod or if it's just supposed to be like the symbolic bubbles popping because our friends are disappearing, you know, it's certainly meant to be uh, that second one, but man, yeah, we, we definitely uh, do not know how, how Kuma's power works. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the motivation is kind of like the, the key thing here that we don't know. It's just, you know, like they, they probably would have been captured and or killed, you know, had, had he not done that and mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. what what is the alternative to that that kuma wants and why does he want that and what did he whisper to rayleigh and you know like oh my god it could be anything if you got asked this question where would you pick to go like if you just you know oh yeah like not like in in a real life context or a one piece world context oh that's a good question yeah. Give me just, both. Yeah, just teleporting somewhere uh wouldn't really get me that much IRL, you know, if it's more of a like if you could relocate somewhere where it would be it'd be like somewhere like New Zealand or Chile, you know, somewhere not somewhere that none of the major powers have any beef with and is slightly isolated and a uh, relatively stable economy. Um I like one, that. One Piece world. Uh, hmm. Uh, it's a it's a it's a place that uh that I, that I can't tell you about yet. But water. Yeah, seven, that's true. Water Seven would be the one of the ones you've seen that I'd probably like to just go around and hang out the most. That makes sense. Yeah, I didn't really think about that. If I choose One Piece, that there's probably places that are like ideal that we haven't even approached yet it gets, I, uh, it gets some, some wild locations i'll tell you i'm really excited about i mean having seen been to this bubble island i just what else is in store mm-hmm. um if i were going to choose a place to hang out i think i might it's sort of i i am a person of extremes a lot of the time so i would either want the like beach hangout of Nami's Island, like the the chill, or I would want to go to Chopper's where it's snow all the time and just hide Mm. in a cabin and have a crackling fire and drink cocoa and read books. Yeah. Um, And in the real world, pretty much the same. Yeah. Either of those two things would work for me. But this, like, I really like the fact that when Perona is asked, she gives him a real answer. She takes it kind of seriously, Mm. but I understand why anybody else who gets asked might not say, give him a straight answer because like, it's a very strange fucking question to be asked in the middle of what seems to be a flat out brawl. And you don't exactly want to get like, you know, vulnerable with the guy who is about to, potentially erase you from existence <laughs> but but perona has thought about this a lot and she's very passionate about what she wants i love her whole i i really do hope that we see her again because yeah. her entire vibe is just so great mm. um so the and the alternative to them being sent to somewhere like And the only reason that I would say that I'm pretty fixed on him sending them somewhere is because he can teleport himself, it seems like. So, because he can, you know, just suddenly be right in front of you out of nowhere. So, I'm hoping that what he's doing is moving to an actual space. But if not, can he be like storing them somewhere in his weird like shrinking them and making them hang out in some weird little uh i don't know prepared space like a lunchbox in his armor you know just like 
N none of his other powers seem to be related to paw shaped bubbles. So it's like he could really do anything with it. And he's like, okay, yeah. well, sure, that whatever. I um, I also really like if, and granted, I'm I'm sort of acting like if you if you ask the question. And you don't give him an answer, then he will automatically send you to the default place, which I don't know if that's at all anything. But all of our friends who get teleported away this episode, if that's what I'm calling it, it I really want them to wind up together mm. wherever they go. I'm like, I know that that's kind of a lot to ask. But as much as it seems to me to make more sense, probably, to be putting them in individual spaces, just because of the bubble thing, if that isn't the case, I would like for them to be with their friends and not completely freaking out. Because at least they know they're with their own people, which is the tragedy of Luffy being the only one that doesn't get tapped over there, you know? Mm -hmm. I just, guys, I really don't like this. It's very upsetting overall. I know, as Shane has said, everybody's not dead. I don't even think Luffy believes they're dead. I don't think he even thinks that, necessarily. But they have been completely removed from the equation for the moment. In a way that they did not consent to and don't understand... And it's just as each person one by one gets tapped, the desperation in Luffy and the way that they each try to get away, but this guy moves through space in such a manner that you cannot just run. It doesn't matter. There was something just so inevitable about how this went down. And it made me feel really bad for Luffy. It really did. I just hated having it where we end up at the end where he is just like saying, I didn't do anything. I couldn't stop him. You know, how could I? That broke my heart, y'all. He's like convulsing. It's such a build up too, because like at the, like, and he's lobby, like, when he pulls out gear second, he's like, you know, I realized, like, during this fight, it's just like, I, I, I'm really going to have to be able to step it up, you know, if I'm going to make sure that I can always protect my friends. Mm -hmm. And then you get to Thriller Bark, and Moria at one point says, you're really not ready for the new world. And, you know, and, but the whole time, you know, it's one piece. It's, it's just, you know, things are going to be great, and we're <laughs> going to have a happy, fun adventure. And then, nope. Turns out the Straw Hats are, are not ready for for the new world. And, uh, you know, Luffy, yeah, I, I imagine Luffy probably doesn't think they're dead. But it's just like, you know, it's still running through his mind. It's like we could be, like, separated forever. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. can't, I can't be there if we are separated. Then I can't be there to protect any of them. Yeah. So. And even if they are, like, even if... He sees them again in just a second. They're yeah. around the corner. The knowledge that somebody was able to absolutely take matters out of your hands so entirely <laughs> that anything you tried to do to resist them was pointless and doomed to fail. That is a very sobering thought. Hmm. Like, I, I feel like Luffy has had an attitude of no matter what, we'll face it together. We can always do something. And it seems like this is the first time we have had a real, oh, it's no contest sort of situation. Mm. You know, there have been a, plenty of times where it seemed like they are outmatched, but they've been able to fight up to a point yeah. and it will grind to a halt and our friend will be hurt or, you know, things will be at a really like difficult impasse, but it's always felt like there was something we could do. And this is the first time that it has really seemed like not really, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it, what he is here to do is going to get done. 
and you are just like objects in a china cabinet that he's rearranging where he wants them to be and you don't get any say in it you know <sighs> you guys bummed me out it did all right shall we begin at the beginning sure yeah with beppo oh you yeah. guys beppo is i think beppo is the same voice actor as the one doing uh, Kirazu, I'm not positive about that, but I think it's the same guy, and he's just doing oh. like a different like vibe to his voice. Interesting. He sounded sort of familiar when he goes down, and he's like, "Oh, okay, I guess I'll just stay down." There was something very familiar sounding about him, but he yeah, he is doing uh, his like wonderful posturing and the sort of battle cry. And then he goes up, and this is uh, against the real Kuma, I think. Is he against the real Kuma? Yeah, because he's got like the little. Well, no, this is the fake one, huh? They, yeah, they all have a all. All three of them have a fake one. They're they're facing, and then the real one shows up uh, with the Bible. Right. Okay. Um. So he gets like slapped down. It's so. Again, it just feels like there's no contest here at all. Um, and then we have each of the different captains who are chiming in with their own, like, brand of attack. So Captain Kid has his weird giant metal arms from attracting metal to himself. I'm assuming his whole thing is like an actual magnet power. Because I think I had been saying at one point that it seemed like he just attracted objects to him. And I didn't quite clock the fact that it's all metal objects that mm -hmm. he's attracting. So I don't know why I didn't notice that. But there it is. Um, and this robot Kuma, you know, does the whole... Every time that he opens his mouth and does that, like, light sort of concentrating thing. Yeah. Do you remember Independence Day? Oh, uh, yeah. And the, like, blue laser that came mm -hmm. out of the... That is what I keep thinking of every time, is all the people who are, like, dancing on the top of the building to welcome the aliens with their big signs, and they look up and they see this, like, gathering of light. It's beautiful! And then you just huh. see the entire building get zapped. Yeah. So he zaps... Uh, kid and all of there's like a lot of room between everybody so from afar a lot the other captains are sort of observing this and trying to get a handle I think on what they can expect from Kuma hmm. and kid is pretty effective I would say despite the fact that he doesn't do what he thought he would do it's not like it doesn't do anything. I mean, I'm giving him some credit here because a lot of these attacks have been cut off, like Beppo. But is it Beppo? Did I get yeah. that right? Mm -hmm. He just literally puts up a hand and is like, not now. Like a three year old that you're just trying to keep away from a hot stove. Like there's no effort to it, nothing. With Kid, when he attacks, this uh, bot goes down for a minute, and it seems like maybe that's had more of an effect, at least than I was sort of expecting, because I thought that this thing was just going to be able to resist with no issue. But he does stand back up again. It isn't like it's, you know, it's it, he brought the bot down for long enough that I personally think if the other captains had jumped in at that point, maybe something more could have been done. There's a, there's a lot of that in, in like this in anime in general, where it's just like, all right, they're down. Now go kill them. Mm -hmm, the job. Mm -hmm. You know, two headshots. And everybody shot. just stands around staring. Yeah. <laughs> like they're asking each other, is that really all it took to take him down? Well, if you're not sure... 
Yeah. Guy carrying a giant sword. I have a suggestion. Maybe don't chill on the sidelines, sipping a drink and conversing. Mm. Get in there. Allegedly, you're a badass, but you're just out here. All right, sure, fine. Um, and granted, like after he attempts another attack, that dude does have does pop up with the sword, but he he waits until this dude has stood up again instead of just jumping in while the guy is down. And uh kid is like, I didn't ask for your help. And I'm like, dude, you, this is just something I will never understand. I, I am not the type to be like, I could have handled it. You are in front of an audience, sir. And they all saw you almost get melted by whatever the fuck that beam was. I know that you think that you're saving face, but you really are just coming across as like very petulant and childish. I want to like kid a little bit. I'm having a hard time. Maybe it'll get easier. I <laughs> again. I, uh, what's the name of, I keep forgetting it's law. Mm -hmm. The, the other one of, of those three law. Right. Um, yeah, he's the one with the sword and he jumps in and is like, what, do you think you'd be able to take down a real warlord that easily? So he knows that this thing isn't the deal because it's a kid is surprised by the fact that it's a robot. And I think maybe, <laughs> I don't know if this is like the assumption that I would make or not. But if I had never dealt with a warlord and I took one down and I saw that it was a robot, I think that I would assume all the warlords were robots. Ah. You know what I mean? I could I could see uh coming to that conclusion. Now, you know, if he he never we don't know if he ever faced a warlord before, but you know, it, it That's also ends true. up. But so he doesn't have like, and this is where, you know, the dreaded uh, power scaling, as some people uh, hate to call it, um, you know, clearly these robot versions aren't, aren't as strong as the real one. So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, law, law coming in with that is like, oh, well, if it's, if it's dead this easily, then there's no way. Why do you say that some people hate to call it that? Oh, it's, so it's like. Uh, some people hate the topic as a, as a form of discussion at all. Now there okay. are some people who really like to argue, like, would this character beat this character one V one, you know? Gotcha. And, and like, there's a really kind of, uh, aggressive and degenerate way that that conversation can happen online. Degenerate. I know that, I know the way you mean that word, but it just sounds like calling everybody who engages in it degenerates and that's very funny well, to me but... well, no, no, i am i'm saying okay. i'm saying that people of a certain type of degeneracy like to just like have these fights about who would win without yeah but there's <laughs> you know we we know if usap beat kizaru the admiral one-on-one -on -one, that would be immensely that would take us out of the story very much because you know we'd have to suspend so much disbelief on you know what we understand the power scaling to be right and, and so you know it's one of so but there's a lot of situations where it's like okay these characters are, are coming up against each other you know who's who's gonna win and by how much and there is you know I don't know. So but it's very you are subjective. somebody who doesn't like that topic of conversation generally. Oh no, I do. I enjoy. Oh, you do. Okay. It when, when it's when it's relevant, like here, like you know, power scaling warlord versus robot copy of a warlord. You know, it's relevant. It's it's why Law knows this thing, and and Kid hasn't had the experience yet. And there, mm -hmm. There's like a lot going because we're near the end of the story now too, and the whole thing. So a lot of the quote unquote, you know, like final matchups of of people fighting are starting to to happen and it's just like oh who can beat who so the power gotcha. scaling discussion is always there and i like talking about it but some people don't yeah it's a tricky thing because like i definitely there's certainly 
rhyme and reason to a lot of it, but then there are times where it feels like people survive things that are painted as like really deadly. And then I start to get very confused about what I'm supposed to believe the bad guy is capable of if this person was able to just survive the thing. Like, how scared should I be? Um, Which is always tough because of the fact that you've got folks who are not going to die. And, like, you know that's the point is that Mm -hmm. they're going to make it to the end. It can can fuck with the idea of the – type like what power people are working with because how do you portray somebody being really affected by a thing if they are able to like just get up next episode and keep right. fighting or walking or whatever i feel like with uh kuma it's actually pretty good because of the fact that zoro is still suffering from his injuries after being put into that weird bubble, like this is definitely the longest we have seen an injury persist on the show. I think. Am I wrong? In terms of, in terms of pure episode count, like in a way that's like debilitating for their ability to fight. Yeah, I think so. So I feel like that's a good, like a good way to approach it. I, I hope that this is something that continues is to just like have people be t- taken out for the count down for the count out i don't know which way i'm supposed to say that i really feel lately like my brain is slowly starting to decompose inside of my skull and i'm just losing like turns of phrase and saying them out loud you know when you look at a word too long and you feel like that's not mm-hmm. language that's nothing it's like that i i'll say a turn of phrase and then i question it so much that I begin to think that this is not actually even a real turn of phrase that I made it up. It's down for the count, right? There is a down for the count, I know. But out for the count also makes sense. So that's why I wasn't, yeah. So Mm. it works for me. So, yeah, having Zoro be the one that's like really bad, especially Zoro as our main fighter, that's a really high impact sort of injured party as well so i feel like he is sort of because i was getting sort of frustrated by it you know and not really sure how the 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 way that kuma's bomb goes off on thriller bark oh yeah and we see that massive explosion and it's all this like drama and it seems like the island has literally vanished for a second and then it's all back and it's fine and almost nothing seems to have even been hurt except for like a building Mm -hmm. that was my going all right i don't what why am i supposed to care yeah but with zoro now i feel like we've got a workaround Mm -hmm. and now i am like okay if this can last this long and especially on somebody who is so tough like that's his whole thing then it, that's intimidating. At least if I know somebody can't die, I can under, I can see that it's possible they will just be removed from our lineup for the foreseeable future. And that's not a thing we want. Yeah. He's definitely willing to, he's willing to sacrifice believability in that aspect for the dramatic moment, like the whole tell thing and Alabaster surviving the bomb in the sky. And, you know, but oh, I forgot about that. He, he, but yeah, you know, he didn't want to kill Pell, but he couldn't. He couldn't. Uh, he couldn't have that moment without doing that. And so it's, it's you know, you get this cool big big paw blow up at the end of the thriller bark, and it looks so cool and dramatic. But then it's just like, uh, it wasn't that bad, you know. It's just yeah, uh, it's just big. I forgot that whole thing with Pell. I was so mad. You mm-hmm. guys remember? I was basically like, if he's still alive, I'm going to quit the show. And then he was. But they waited so long to show me that he was still alive that I kind of like so all right you can have this one i guess um (laughs) all right so at this point kid is in the midst of talking to law and is saying if he well if he isn't a warlord then what is he and all of a sudden there's this huge crash and he looks up and it's like the silhouette of kuma with his uh 
Arnold Schwarzenegger eye in Terminator because he's got that red like glow, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and we cut away from there to the moment where Zorro is on the ground and he is about to be stomped on by Kizaru, whose foot is glowing. I just really want to reiterate. These guys are so very large. <laughs> They're so big, you guys. Like, I think Kizaru is probably about 15 feet tall. I think. I'm curious. Ooh, is there like a height spreadsheet oh, somewhere? I yeah. should have known yeah. that. He looks like he could easily like t- his head would breach the roof of my house with the attic. So yeah, I'm putting I'm putting 15 feet. I wouldn't be surprised if he was even bigger. But let's say 15. Okay, so uh Kizaru like isn't quite the no, one thing that happens with both the anime and the manga is that he will also kind of make certain like proportions more extreme to make a moment more dramatic also. So, Fair. Like, okay, yeah. So, so his official height uh is is uh nine feet eleven inches. Don't buy um, it. No, he's much taller than that. Nope, that's wrong. Um, and that, but then, you know, people go, so white beard, the, the guy he met on a ship at one point, uh, he's, um, 21 feet, 10 inches tall. So excuse yeah, me. Yeah. Just, you know, that's just how it goes. You know, people can be, big, but see, the thing is, we know there are giants in this world and, you know, it's, it's, uh, like, uh, like Hagrid, you know, where it's just like I'm... one, you know, lots of generations down, you know? I just can't. The only way that I can accept that there's like hybrid human giants is that the woman was the giant in the giant human setup because otherwise, ouch. (laughs) And even if we're not dealing with ouch, we have got, a proportion that I have to imagine she'd need like seven or eight regular human dicks to feel anything because that one dick is not going to be doing it. If you're a very large, like these giants in this world, they're seriously humongous. What are you doing? Just like How you know, crawl in there. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm sorry. You went there first. I think I may have like said something about this when Rashawn and I were talking about Hagrid that his dad was like in there. Yeah, that's the the the, oh. the Hagrid conundrum. I hate this. There's got to be so much like creepy fanfic out there, right? With this stuff, I don't mean just like One Piece. I mean just like giants. Oh yeah, I'm sure there's just... something somewhere. As a... <laughs> oh man, uh, there's no good way to like find out because if I just search giant vaginas, that's not going to get me what I want. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. Uh, Gus says maybe male giants have surprisingly small penises. <laughs> you know what? I thought Gus... gorillas have. Gorillas are huge and have like you know like one inch. You know. Do they really? Yeah, yeah, they have they have tiny little, little I didn't know that. Little teeny things. Okay, you know what? I like that. Let's go with that then. We'll say that it's like the gorilla situation. Uh let's see. Demian says a lot of people think that having a devil fruit can make people have more random growth spurts defend- depending on the fruit. The vast majority of people that are larger than normal have devil fruits, and all the ones without are always remarked upon as freaks of nature. Ha. Huh. I'm going to plug in the charger real quick. One sec. Okay, no problem. I kind of like that theory, Demian. Um, that, like, depending on the power yeah, you that you can have, working. growth spurts. 
because like I'm thinking about um you know the way that things work for Chopper is that it's not like he just turns into a human. He has like a couple stages weirdly. So I could see that if you are a human already that maybe there's some sort of weird effects that it can have. All right, I accept it. Uh Bernadette says horrifying thought breeding programs. You know, as horrifying as that feels like it should be, Bernadette, I prefer the idea that we're just going to take a giant ovum and human sperm and mix them together in a test tube, test pitcher, perhaps, depending on the size of the ovum. I don't know how big that would be if it's a giant. But, yeah, and then you could just, like, implant in a surrogate, you know. I prefer that. But also, if I, I, I suspect that's not what you meant by breeding program, so I'm just going to smooth sail right past that, and we're just <laughs> going to not at all talk about it. Um, so anyway, uh, Kizaru is about to stomp on Zoro, and this is when Usopp steps in and starts to try and shoot things at him with his awesome slingshot. All of it goes right through him. Brooke steps up and tries to stab him in the chest. Goes right through him as well. I love that they're just sort of continuing to do the thing that they just saw doesn't work really repeatedly to the point that Kizaru is like, yo, dude, there's no point to this. What are you doing? Why are you, why are you continuing this? And then he says, I ate the glint glint fruit. And now I'm made of light. Uh, I gotta say, surprise the name for this one. And it's not like a bad name. It's a little hard to say. Like you say glint glint fruit. Glint glint fruit. You're not getting the T, right? You've got to really enunciate yeah. glint, glint fruit. It just feels difficult. Gum gum fruit is granted also kind of a weird name for like the rubber fruit power. We've got other names that for f f like devil fruits that are extremely basic to what they are. Like wasn't Mr. Two's or Mr. Three, Mr. Three's just the wax wax fruit. Yeah. So it's interesting to me how sometimes it's just a very literal direct, like we're going to name it what it does. And then sometimes it's going to be like, oh, we're going to name it after a sort of, you know, synonym for what you would say this does, yeah. you know? So like the, the story behind uh, the Japanese name for Kizaru's fruit is the Pika Pika no Mi. Pika is in Pikachu, which means like, so Pika is an onomatopoeia for something that like glitters or sparkles. Okay. Like, yeah. And, and, and so a lot of the Japanese names are kind of like little, little references or puns like that. And so, yeah, uh, oftentimes, yeah, the, the English translation to that, which, you know, has to be a word that's like short, you know, that could be repeated like that. Um, yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't quite mesh the same way. I wish that they had named it something like the glitter glitter fruit. Yeah. Like that be would be, good. you know, I feel like that's kind of a fun, um, I didn't know that Pika Pika was sparkly cause that makes sense. Cause he's like electricity, right? Mm -hmm. It's his deal. Um, <laughs> well, light. Yeah. No, I'm talking about Pikachu. Oh, I'm Pikachu. So sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was getting ice from my uh, from my fridge today, and it has like a button that you can press to have crushed ice instead of the cubes. And all the button says is like there's a picture of a uh, you know animation of it falling, and it says ice type underneath. And I really want to like do something with that and make a Pokemon ice type joke, mm. and I can't come up with it. So if anybody out there has got a good idea for something that I could print out and tape above the ice type on my fridge as a little uh, winky jokey bit. Let me know what you got. Gus is saying gum gum equals 
Gomu Gomu no Mi. Translated, it's the rubber rubber fruit. Okay. Uh, I think I remember him saying that. That sounds familiar. So, De and Demian is saying it's always onomatopoeias. Yeah, that's too bad that that's lost. I wouldn't mind like a list of all of them that we've run into along the way. All the ones that aren't onomatopoeias are wordplay or Japanese numerology. What does that mean? Numerology. Different numbers just like have different because what what it is is like you can you can take what the syllables for a number and like if you take those syllables like that are that you speak the number with but then like translate it to like one of the other Japanese scripts then it means like a different word so so it's a lot of times like like two syllables you know can have like two or two or three different meanings based on whether it's like kanji hiragana that oh kind of so, so there's like so there's like a bunch of and, and then there's just like certain like associations with numbers that just happen like by themselves that I'm like like not as familiar with but I'm super curious about that um just because like I can't think of anything like remotely equivalent in English to like yeah. words that are associated with certain numbers you know but then also like so for example there's a series called Bleach and the main character's main the main character's name is Ichigo and Ichigo is a word that means strawberry but the numbers 1 and 5 are ichi and go so you know another another way to interpret his word is 1 5 but like that's not a real word but just his name is Ichigo but it's like got both strawberry and 1 5 like packed into that so it's it's just it's yeah huh interesting Interesting. All right. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. I bet that's fun to play around with. We should, we should have more going on with our language. Yeah. It's weird. We've made our language like so overcomplicated in ways that are not interesting or helpful. <laughs> and then like anything that could be cool. We're just like, nah, we're one meaning, maybe two. Um, so anyway, this is when, uh, Chopper, like off to the side, is yelling for Zoro to run away. And Zoro is saying that he can't because he is way too weak. And Sanji, like everybody is sort of prepared to do something. It looks like Sanji is about to run in there for a second. But Robin uses her powers to sort of like scoop him. And she rolls him away. And I'm thinking, oh, perfect. You guys, this bitch just follows those arms just traps Zoro again it's nothing it's so embarrassing i hated this for her like her power t usually is fucking clinch it it's saves lives so often we she comes through on for us so often that how completely this fails really caught me off guard because he just it's it's he doesn't even miss a beat really and uh yeah that's again another like shift in place that feels very similar to kuma but he doesn't have the same like clearly hasn't eaten the same devil fruit so is that an ability that isn't even related to the devil fruit at all that they picked up somehow or is it just that they each have an ability that can be turned to the same advantage where they can each basically teleport because of loopholes with their power being light. Yeah. Traveling at the speed of light, like that makes sense. But then there's the bubble thing. I don't know how that would aid in teleportation right but yeah, he's the, clearly that's what he's doing it seems yeah, like the bubble thing the bubble thing is weird uh, in on a like small scale you know like any's lobby we got the whole like shave thing where it's just like they, they kick right. the air and they, they go really, and so you know most most strong characters at this point are going to be able to quote unquote teleport you know a short distance by just like moving really fast but uh yeah it, it does it does seem like interestingly uh you know, uh, Kizaru and 
potentially you know yeah how how do how do bubbles how would bubbles teleport somebody but you know yeah because i'm i keep trying to like make that fit into somehow but it doesn't really it's just sort of if you're it's like the same thing as being able to practically fly you know um where it technically being able to fly is like its own power but our guys can like leap 15 feet into the air and fight in midair for like two full minutes. And it seems like that's pretty much flying, but nobody treats it that way. It's um, skywalking. You, you're kicking the air. Sure you are. I don't believe you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the in, in world explanation for it. I don't believe you. I don't believe uh, okay. that. Let's say okay. that. I don't believe in skywalking. Sorry, Luke. Okay. But, you know, what can you do? Um, so, yeah, he is, like, completely charged up is the wording I want to use with his foot and saying, time to die. We get a long, like, everybody screaming and rushing forward trying to do something. And then here comes Rayleigh. And Rayleigh kicks him. And... This man explodes like 10 neutron bombs. It's. He's fine. Like immediately fine. So clearly it's not him exploding. It's, it's that his power that he was about to use detonated in the air after getting kicked. But. When I say that fucking sky turns blood red for a second and it's the whole sky, it is quite dramatic. So when he just stands up and it's like nothing happened almost, like he's just standing there almost exactly where he had been. It looked like he got kicked into the sky and... I'm assuming that he did, but because he can travel like light, he can return just as quickly and it's not really being knocked out of place isn't a problem for him. But it really like confused me for a second. I'm not going to lie. I thought we were going to have to like wait for him to recover at least, at least like two or three seconds. And it's not, he's instantly back in place. Um, and Rayleigh says to him, don't go picking these buds before they sprout. Their era is only just beginning. And I want to see what they do with it. Which I do really, really like that. Just as a motivating factor for him. It's not even like, personally, I really like these kids and I'd be upset if you hurt them. More just being like, no, they're interesting. And I just kind of want to see what happens. Not necessarily that those things are mutually exclusive, but I really do enjoy the, the idea of somebody older who has had like wild powers and has sort of gone on the DL for a while, just kind of wanting like to sit back and see some entertainment from other young folks who are stepping into the breach, you know? Uh, sorry, this is Bernadette saying, so let's move the chat along. Nothing to see here. Keep moving. Oh, oh, there was a spoiler. Okay. Not, I'm not looking. I think, I think, Everybody I think just, will... what's that? Uh, I just, I, I don't remember all of that being explained quite so explicitly. It's not, it's not a, it's not a big deal. It's like a, a scientifically you know, sort of valid way that the paw thing could could potentially like teleport somebody. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and Gus is saying, pretty sure he explained it at the end of Thriller Bark. Demi is saying, so it's not necessary. It's not a spoiler. Oh, okay. I don't know what to do then because I kind of want to read it. I thought it's, it's not- more like. Because it was explained that his paws could deflect anything. I just didn't remember that if it, like, 
because his, his comment said it was uh, deflected up to light speed. And I just didn't remember that specifically being mentioned. Which okay. So, so it's like just, just like a minor thing. It's not, not, a, not a huge, huge spoiler. But, you know, I guess theoretically, you know, if he could, if he could put them in a bubble and hit them, like deflect that bubble, you know, fast mm. enough, that could be a way of, of teleporting somebody. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I like this, this light speed control we've got going on. What happened yeah. with these like new powers? I'm trying to think of something else that's sort of equivalent. What's the name of the dude who does the ice? Aokiji. Aokiji. That's right. Uh, cause like, you know, being able to control cold, uh, is a power that you see a lot in, but I feel like stuff with light can be a lot of illusion magic mm. is sort of played as being, uh, light. And considering the fact that he's a root is like appearing in front of them, but he isn't actually there. He, he, he says he's made of light, but it almost feels like you could call that an illusion, or maybe he could perf- create illusions, perform illusions. I don't know the way that I want to say that. That'd be, um, that'd be interesting if he could uh, project uh, an, an illusion of himself with the light. You know, yeah. Because if you're made of light, and so many of your powers are based around light, could you just mold other light into a copy of yourself? Like actually, because the thing with Kizaru is like their attacks don't land, but he can sure as fuck hit them. I think the way you would end up having to do that is, I don't know, is maybe like, like projecting the light through someone's like, eyelids or something like, like eyeballs to like, like, I don't know if you could, I don't know if you could make a bunch of photons like appear in a way that like looks realistic, hmm. but I don't know. You'd have to reflect, reflect other things. I don't know. Interesting to think about. Um, so Gus is saying Alchemist says that he deflects air at the speed of light to use his pad cannon, which is where I got the light speed part from. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I just hadn't remembered um, okay, okay, sorry guys. So, because we've talked about so much sort of out of order that it's hard to know when I should even bother returning to, you know, what's actually happening in the moment on in the episode we're talking wow. about. Um, but basically, we have Rayleigh and Kizaru engaging in a fight here, really saying, I would love to just fucking retire and get out of this game, but you guys won't leave me alone. You keep posting like my photo everywhere. And Kizaru is like, dude, do you think that just because you're ready to retire, all the consequences of your crimes just go away? No, of course we're still chasing you. What are you talking about? Um, And they're also noticing that Rayleigh's hit did connect, even though theirs didn't. Which I have to assume is something to do with hockey. I really hate saying that because it just sounds like I'm talking about the sport. Guys, it's H A K I. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're listening to this, you knew what I meant. But to me, with you know, not having gotten used to this word yet. Whenever it's brought up, that's my, if I'm not looking at the screen at the subtitles and seeing the spelling of it, I'm always just like, hockey, what are they talking? Oh, right. It's always takes a minute. I'm sure that I will get used to it and stop having that sort of association in my brain soon. Fingers crossed. Um, and Rayleigh says, why don't you just look the other way and let these kids go? Kizaru is saying, man, are you living in a fantasy world? Of course I can't do that. The celestial dragons are going to make my life miserable. They're all up in our shit, like the Marines. I can't just let that be like, you know, and uh, it's sort of interesting because 
I had said when we were on Thriller Bark and the way that Kuma swooped in, it felt like Kuma was trying to help in a weird way. And that's sort of what I'm thinking he might be trying to do here is everybody who gets like zapped away is somebody who isn't capable of fighting at the level that Luffy is. At least in terms, that's tricky to say because I feel like people are going to want to argue with me about this. Would you say Zoro is as strong as Luffy as a fighter? Yeah, the the, the general answer is is no. There, it's and there's an interesting. There are, there are specific parts of the story where where I think uh, Zoro would potentially beat Luffy in a one on one fight, just like them, specific because of, because of the matchup thing, right? Cutting versus versus the the, the right. Thing. But in, in general, uh, you know, Luffy is definitely the the overall you know strongest person on the crew, uh, pretty much at all times. So if we if we go with that then you could see what Kuma did as a favor. All Luffy keeps yelling is for everybody to run. Like everybody is so overmatched here, outmatched. See? You see what I'm saying? Overmatched? I would never have said that like last year or the year before. Something is eating at my brains. I'm so sorry, everybody. You're about to watch like the quality of all my podcasts just slowly, very slowly be eaten away by the acid of existential dread, I think is probably what's doing it. Um, but they're so outmatched and he keeps trying to get them to run. I want to believe that Kuma is like, I got you, man. And just sort of putting them in the cupboard out of the way for a second. While they, while all the big boys fight, you know what I'm saying? It's reasonable. It's something other than killing them, and it's just like, yeah, hopefully they're, hopefully they're 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 put all together again. But like, like where we're supposed to be going to Fishman Island right now? We're supposed to be going to the second right. half of the new world. You know what else is going on in the world right now? You know, is any of that gonna gonna mess with anything? Yeah. Could he just be putting them back on the sunny? That well, would be sun- pretty dope. That that would be if they were like ready to go and stuff and able, but they have to. Uh, the ship coding takes three days. Right, right. And Rayleigh is not on that ship coding job. He's out here fighting, so I have to assume that's been a little bit delayed. Hmm. I I assume maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know what kind of assistance he's got. I don't know what kind of automation he's working with. Maybe he's got a whole like just pull in the ship and then press a button and take a lunch break and the ship gets coded. I just Kuma is not against them the way it seems like he is. He he's so intimidating a figure with such wild powers that it's really hard to not see him as a threat, which I mean, he, I'm not saying he's not a threat, but I'm just saying his motivations seem like a lot more clouded. And I, the thing that's like driving me nuts about him is I feel like if this is true, if my suspicion that he's like trying to help in his weird way is correct, he could tell them that. He could communicate and be like, don't worry, I'll help, guys. But he doesn't. He's just doing the thing and causing Luffy to have a complete mental break. And watching him do it, by the way. Like, he stands and watches Luffy just completely fall apart. So, if it does turn out that I'm right and Kuma has been sort of trying to help this whole time in his way but he just decided not to volunteer that information there better be a damn good reason that he couldn't have said out loud hey I'm helping that's all I'm saying one of these young kids these days are too optimistic (laughs) need to have the rug pulled out from under him 
I just really want the guy's got little bear paws. It's cute. I don't want the bad guy to have a little cute bear ears and little bear paws. That's too cute. That's adorable. Like, that's not a power for a bad guy. It's not that duality. Super tall and imposing, but then his voice is like kind of, he's like very soft spoken and, and kind of quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoy it. it do you watch the sub? Is I watched the sub. Similar voice? I don't. I don't even know exactly what the dub sounds like. I should, uh, I should check it, but it's, it's like definitely on the higher end pitch wise mm-hmm. for guys and just like very, it's like he's talking in a library, just very calm, you know? Yeah. That's basically what it sounds like with the dub as well mm-hmm. is when he says, don't interfere. It's don't interfere. Yeah. Like, very little not little enunciation but there's not a lot of emphasis Mm -hmm. put on any of it and uh i don't know if that's just like his personality in general or if it's the fact that he is working on the dl towards some cause that we don't know about and so he is trying to keep himself to himself but i really kind of like that voice like this show is is funny that way because the voice actors for certain characters take me by surprise a lot. Like Luffy's grandfather, his voice actor really caught me off guard. Cause that guy does not have nearly as like low and rough a voice as I would expect from a dude who looks the way that he does. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I just, anyway, Kuma, let, let me, I'm, I'm just going to say it. I want I want Kuma to be a helper because his motif is too adorable and I want things to be okay with our friends and I feel like while we do have really on their side he himself is like in too much trouble because they want him as well Kuma operating on the DL would be more helpful in some ways. Really, I think outpowers Kuma. Would we say that? I'm putting another power. That's a, yeah, that's a question mark for sure. I feel like he must because, like, <sighs> it's one of those things because, like, he he was keeping up and fighting with Kizaru, but it's like mm-hmm. would he. Would he beat Kizaru if it was just like, you know, 1v1 all the way to the death? And it's just, you know, we, we don't know. We, we know that certainly we would expect the, the vice captain of the Pirate King's crew, you know, in his prime to be able to do so. But it's just like how much, how much has age, you know, and then how, how strong is Kizaru compared to Kuma? So I, I don't know. It's, I think it's, I think it's very, very up in the air could, could go, uh, we we haven't even seen that much. We haven't seen Kuma really be pressed either. You know, he's only he's only been dealing with that's people true. That he can deal with easily, so we don't know how how high his ceiling goes yet either. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Hmm, a lot of question marks. Mm-hmm. I just really, I am wanting Kuma to be on their side because I want there to be somebody on their side who it feels like is sort of an insider. And if he is kind of secretly working with them, it makes, it gives me a sense of like sort of comfort, you know, like they've got a person in their corner that, that potentially could really have an effect. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's why I like really want to believe it, but also I don't know what his motivation, like, why would he be trying to help? What is that about? I know that he mentioned something about being connected to Ace at one point, like that he had the same reputation of like being a good captain as Ace did, something like that. Yeah, it was, it was Dragon at the end of the Thriller Bark. uh, Dragon, right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and and about how, uh, how, you know, your, your son has picked good companions. 
Right. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time here and we've got about 45 minutes. Wait, no, we don't. We've got about 20 minutes. Completely misread that. My bad. Um, but we also talked about like for everything else that happens in the episode. Yeah. Themselves. We, we've kind of gone over. So, you know, we're not, we're not really pressed on that because it's just, you know, what order of people did, did he make go away? <laughs> uh, yeah, this is like the other power that I found sort of interesting. Kizaru is, is what does he call it? Something mirror. Um, yeah. And it looks like the same power that he used to travel up onto the rooftops. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's the same thing or not. The, so I have a question about this and, and it may just not really be that important, but you know, he's able, it seems like to sort of teleport in the, in the moment where Robin is rolling Zoro away. Yeah. He can just teleport over to Zoro in an instant. It's not, there's no time lost. It's a, a practically immediate movement. However, that's like somewhat close by. Mm -hmm. And so I'm assuming that that's why he didn't need to use any sort of special power to transport himself there. Because what it looked like he was about to try and do was follow them into the woods because they're like escaping into the trees and he's uh, going to use this mirror power to project himself out ahead of the whole group. Mm -hmm. But then Rayleigh interposes himself and stops him. So I just want to be like sure that I understand the movement that he can take with or without using special abilities because I'm, I sort of forgot that he used that mirror thing that one time with the buildings, and I would think, working with the speed of light and traveling like light, that he should be able to get to the top of that building without using a special technique. Do you know yeah, what I mean? I agree. I think it's, I think one, it's possible that it's just like, you know going at the speed of light, like in one direction, if you need to like go around any kind of corners or bends or anything, like he, he like sets up the mirror to go at like different angles or something like that. And then, yeah, if it's just a straight line to where he needs to go, he doesn't need to do that. Again, it could just be a thing where it's just like that mirror thing going up the buildings that looked pretty cool. You know, it was like, pew, oh pew, yeah, pew, definitely. Pew. It looked awesome. Um, And so, you know, it, it could just be him doing that for, for the effect of it. Um, so, you know, either one. That's interesting. Like getting around corners and stuff. I could see like if he wants to be ahead of them so that when they're running, they're coming straight at him. Then, yeah, he couldn't just go through the whole group. Although technically he could if he's light and they were punching him and it wasn't landing because he's not solid. He right. really should be able to go through the group. It's kind so, of fuzzy on how the, the physics yeah. works behind it. It's fine. It's not important. Like I said, I was just sort of wanting to make sure that I wasn't missing something there. It's um, funny. I find sometimes now in one piece where there'll be one random thing like that, that I'll decide, decide to start picking apart. And it's like, would this really work this way? And then, I, then I think again, this is just like, am I really choosing to dissect this in, in one piece? And this is the line that I draw for what. Yep. And so I just, then I just, Toss it out. Just, it is it so out. easy to get caught up like that. Like mm -hmm. I, I've done it a billion times on this show. Like it, there just came a point where I had to consciously be like, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I will address it just to say it because it like it occurred to me and I want to be open with what I'm thinking, but I, I've tried to really just go. It's magic. Basically it's fine. Whatever. It's to look cool. Mm -hmm. I just some there's occasionally times where is it just to look cool or am I missing something that sort of like dovetail and it can sound like I'm just criticizing and not letting something go when really I'm trying to be like I feel like there's information here that I didn't see. Um so that's the part where I just occasionally get 
hung up is feeling like I just, you know, am not connecting dots that everybody else has already connected. And I feel like uh, a goon. sometimes, sometimes there is just like random information that doesn't seem like it should be that important, but ends up being really important later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, Oh, Funimation. What are you doing, bud? He paused on me. It just completely like shut down. It ah. hasn't done this before. Usually it's Hulu that I have this issue with. And then I press refresh and it brings the volume all the way back up to full. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Blowing my eardrums out. Um, oh my God. I forgot about how Brooke runs with his arms like this. <laughs> Full, full T-shape lifts on either side of his face. He makes a few, like, I'm a skeleton, I'm dead jokes in these two episodes in a way that's very understated and I really appreciated. Yeah. Most of the time he does those and he does a, but I don't have any lungs. And it's a big, like, <laughs> but this time... It's sort of like, well, I guess I'm not even alive anyway. And he just like barely gets it out before some like big thing happens. And I approved of it. I I don't think that's going to get old for me. Maybe it will. But I'm going to predict right now. It's not. I think I'm always going to be a fan of the I don't have skin or organs, am not alive, etc. jokes. There, there are some good ones later, for sure. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, Brooke is just honestly quite a delight, and I, I, I have a. I don't don't think I really like addressed it with myself, but I have a suspicion that Brooke is going to go on his own and hang out with Laboon and just like go live his own life and be away from our friends at some point and I don't want him to do that because I really like him I enjoy all the energy he brings except for the asking to see panties we could really do without that that'd be fine but otherwise I I want him to see Laboon I want there to be a lovely reunion I don't know how he continues to be a Straw Hat crew member. Does Laboon just continue to follow them around like his old crew? I guess that could work. I mean, it'd probably be pretty handy to have Laboon like around for weird, odd jobs. I don't know what that what that looks like, but one one interesting characteristic of uh, the Grand Line in the New World is that at the end of the second half of the Grand Line, uh, technically, is the end of that is the other side of the mountain that Laboon is crashing his head into right now. Right. Yeah. So that's that's just interesting geography. But but yeah, getting getting to Laboon in a way that doesn't disrupt, uh, you know, the because. You know, it's Brooke's dream is to eventually reunite with Laboon, but everybody on the Straw Hats dream is kind of, you know, kind of underneath the the Luffy being Pirate King dream. Yeah, I feel like there can be a way to satisfy because it's it's kind of a thing where it's just like at this point everybody's got to have their dream realized on the crew. You know, Mm -hmm. so we've got to have the Laboon reunion. But I'm sure there's a way we can get it without it. Uh, yeah, but ruining uh, I, everything. Yeah, have, <laughs> having it early and having Laboon come, and you know, Laboon's probably got a mean headbutt at this point, so he could probably, oh, yeah, he could probably keep up in some some ocean combat. He's also got Crocus living in there, oh, yeah, and yeah. I don't know how that would shake out. Like, can Crocus? Laboon was like moving around a ton and Crocus seemed fine. Right? I'm I'm just I don't know how that would work, but I'm not against having Crocus be part of the crew in his way either. I just think he wouldn't be interested. He seems yeah. retired. He's done, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, mm, I don't know. 
Okay. Anyway. Um, so let's, let's get into the whole thing with Chopper because when stuff really begins to go left, Chopper is starting to completely, he is watching each of his friends go up against Kuma and it's like the fake Kuma at this point, I think still. Uh, but he is really growing afraid for everybody to a degree that he decides that he is going to take more rumble balls and turn into this giant ogre like creature again, which, uh, I was very surprised. I've got to admit that he did this again so soon after Thriller Bark. I didn't expect it. I thought somebody would stop him, that he would take like more time to consider and be worried about the harm he could do his friends. And he doesn't. He just looks around and says, everybody's going to die and leaps forward past Robin, who tries to stop him. And he yells, get away from my friends, chomps a couple rumble balls, and then begins to grow. And it happens so quickly that I hadn't even like fully processed what was going on here. And he is facing down with the dude with the big red and white bow, whose name I cannot remember. Uh, Sentamaru. Sentamaru. Sentamaru is working with the Kuma bot? Uh, yeah. Is right? He is, uh, he is the Vegapunk doctor's bodyguard. Right. Okay. He is the doctor who, uh, who, who made the, the Kuma bots. I've got to be honest with you. I don't get, like, the point of this guy. He just seems... I'm just I'm just forgetting he's around. That's how I'll frame it. It's not even that he's like a pointless character, but he is so not a threat that I'm feeling or a person that I'm interested in that I completely forget he's there. And anytime we see him on screen, I'm like, oh, yeah, him. And then immediately forget him again. Yeah. So the whole thing with him... He, like he isn't really a factor in these fights very much either. The only thing that he does at one point is like, I think Luffy is demanding from him where Kuma is like sending people or what's happening to them. And he doesn't know is what it comes down to. He like says something about how, well, legend tells of a, no, it's nothing. It's just like people's guesses and nobody is certain. So he doesn't, he isn't serving that much of a point in the story right. at this juncture. Right. And maybe he will, and maybe I will eat my words, but, oh my God. Demian says, just imagine Frankie getting his hands on Laboon and building him into a cyborg whale submarine. Look, I'm not saying that that couldn't be cool. But I am saying that I have still not watched Guardians of the Galaxy 3 because I have heard that there's a lot of body horror stuff in relation to how Rocket got to be the way that he is. And I cannot be excited about a cyborg whale submarine in the context of the horror that would be to do to this animal who has been through so much already. So if we, if, if something happened and he was injured and there was only one way to save him and that's to make him a cyborg, fine. But that has to be the only thing like otherwise. No, absolutely not. Did you see guardians three? I did not yet. Okay. Cause I've heard some like pretty intense body horror stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'm not like super huge into, I don't know. I don't, I don't go see Marvel movies in theaters as much anymore. I'll, I'll wait for them to come out on streaming. 
that's kind of where I'm at too. I went to see Barbie and that's the first movie I've seen in theaters in like a long time. I did the, the Barbenheimer, uh, double show. There you go. Um, but yeah, the I had a couple people who said that they brought their kids and wish they hadn't because it was mm-hmm. like intense enough that they had difficulty and their yeah. kids were genuinely like really upset by it. So I'm just sort of like, I'm not great with that sort of thing anyway. And if it's bad enough that folks are like, I wouldn't recommend it. I'm going to just sort of stay away and maybe I'll watch it when I can look down at my phone and not see the thing or, yeah. you know, fast forward or go to the bathroom, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, Gus says, what every new pirate that enters the Grand Line think the first thing they see is a giant whale with a straw hat pirate's flag painted really badly on its forehead. That's true. I didn't really think about that. If they see him, he kind of already is a cyborg. And Demian says, the boon already has all kinds of metal hallways in there. He kind of already is a badly built cyborg. I guess that's true. How did that happen? Did, did Crocus build all that in him? Apparently. All right, Crocus, so you can side eye in you now. Mm. Okay. I don't like he, it. He he uh he learned the strategy one time when he made it with the giant. He, you know. Oh my god. I hate you so much. Okay. No, we're leaving. We're leaving. So this <laughs> is when we go to the moment where the uh bot is a bar about about <laughs> I'm trying to say the bot is about, and I'm saying the bot is a bot. Um, the bot is about to attack, and real Kuma, he steps in. And it's interesting because he tells him to stand down, which does make the bot back off. But then, as the next episode continues, he begins to try and attack them again. So it's like he's being given an order, but then somebody else's order is overriding what Kuma is telling him or Kuma telling him to back off only like lasts for so long as a command. And then he has to renew it, so to speak. Like there's, you know what I mean? Like it wears off. I don't know, no. but it, it's, it surprised me because Kuma seems to be able to get it to completely back away and then all of a sudden it starts going for them again and I was sort of not expecting it to come down to him versus himself right but yeah he sees Zoro and is like oh hey Zoro I didn't see you there and Usopp is like Zoro come with me let's get out of here and as he reaches out Kuma slaps Zoro and he completely disappears. Like there's sort of a dust devil that's Mm. left and that's about it. And poor Usopp is completely freaked out because Usopp isn't, I mean, he is very freaked out in the best of times, but he just saw his friend totally vanish. And this is when we get the first look at, all of the giant bubbles hovering above the island and the first one popping. Now, we basically talked about how everybody disappears. Luffy's complete breakdown at the end. Since we're going to be out of time pretty shortly, is there anything specific that you wanted to talk about before we wrap this one up? Nope, we pretty much got you. Know, there's no real way to speculate on on where they they could be. You know, it's, it seems most likely that you know whether they're together or separate. You know, we're going to you know some new place. Don't imagine mm-hmm. we're going to get completely reset to the beginning or anything. But yeah, it's because it's this is like I don't know. This is the the beginning of the best saga so far a lot of people think and and, and it's it's, it's, a, oh boy. it's a roller coaster ride going up a thing here into a into a, a crescendo and it's uh yeah it's gonna be a good good hundred episodes or so oh boy man hundred are you saying from when we started this arc 
or coming up like the next hundred? Uh, we'll say coming up the, maybe, maybe not, maybe at the start. I won't hold you to this. I was just wondering what you meant. From the start about, about a hundred, maybe. Okay. That could, that could be off, but like a decent, a decent chunk. I'm also really compelled by the fact that like Kizaru doesn't seem to really want to be doing this. He's just like the celestial dragons are sort of making it so that I can't say no. And I wonder if uh, they were taken out of the equation, if he would just be like, yeah, whatever guys, I guess go sail away. Enjoy yourselves. Like he just seems so laid back about everything that I want to think he isn't a bad guy. Exactly. He's just following bad orders. Um, I imagine kind of makes you a bad guy, but that high up, it's just like, you know, I'm sure he, he understands what the situation's like. He knows that there are human trafficking auctions that like, you know, shouldn't be there, but that they can't do anything about. So it's just like, I, I imagine it's kind of like real life. It's like, once you get high enough, you kind of get so cynical about the way the whole system is. And it's just like, well, that's just how it is, you know, on, on with my next paycheck. Hmm. True. Well, all right. Um, thank you guys all so much for hanging out with me. And thank you to Shane Kratos for coming and joining me on the episode. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to have somebody else like chilling with me and not having to make all the conversation myself. Right. So lovely to have you. Thank you. I'm really interested in where we're going with this, you guys. I don't like seeing Luffy this down. Luffy's always the guy, even when he's upset, he's like, we can do this. This is the first time that you really see him be like, maybe I can't, though. Maybe Mm -hmm. I can't do this. I don't like it. You heard it here first, folks. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.